Good day, this is Mr. Case, and this is 30.4a. 30.4a. Our topic today is nationalism in India, and then we're going to look at Southwest Asia a little bit later on. Today it's uh, South Asia. After World War I, interest in nationalism in India grows. Interest in nationalism in India grows. For quite a long time, over a hundred years, they had been dominated by India. In fact, India had suffered or had suffered the British rule um, indirectly, and then after the Sepoy Mutiny, the British Raj or direct rule took place. The Congress Party and the Muslim League worked towards Home Rule. The Congress Party and the Muslim League work towards home rule. They realize they're part of the British Empire. The Congress Party is dominated by Hindus. The Muslim League obviously dominated by Muslim. They work together towards home rule, being able to at least locally make their own decisions that affected them. Britain promised reforms in exchange for India's service in World War I. Britain promised reforms in exchange for India's service in World War I. There were quite a few Indians who left India to fight for Britain in World War I. They were promised reforms in exchange for helping India, uh, Britain fight the war. But when that did not happen, radical terrorists, radical terrorist acts in India bring laws to curb a rebellion and dissent. Radical terrorist acts in India bring laws to curb dissent or rebellion. That's where we are. One of them was called the Rowlett Acts. It was passed in 1919, the year that World War I ended. Government is to jail protesters without trial for two years. The government could jail protesters without trial for two years. So if you are gathering together to protest against the British government, you could be jailed. Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims protest the unfair Rowlett Acts. Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims protest the unfair Rowlett Acts. They aren't even allowed to protest. They have to keep their mouths shut. Well, they disobeyed the law and they protested. They gathered together. What results is the Amritsar Massacre. The Amritsar Massacre. In 1919, General Reginald Dyer ordered British troops to fire on the crowd. He ordered troops to fire on the crowd. Some of his men said, should we send warning shots or give them warning? No, the general said. They've been warned, no meetings. And what he did was unthinkable. He fought, his troops fired into the crowd and over 400 died. They were unarmed and 1,200 were wounded. A massacre is a one-sided fight. These unarmed folks f uh, were fired upon, 400 die. 1,200 are wounded. This act by General Dyer was not sanctioned by the British troops. He just did this on his own. He wanted to send a message to India, no meetings, you will obey the laws. What he did, in hindsight, is he turned peaceful Indians into radicals. He did not do Britain any favors by what he did. In fact, he was brought up on charges for this. There was outrage in India. Outrage in India turns loyal British subjects into nationalists. Loyal British subjects were turned into nationalists and they demand independence. They demand independence. Outrage in India turns loyal British subjects like the Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims were into nationalists. If you're going to fire on unarmed people, I don't want to be part of the empire. I want my independence. 
So almost overnight, that's what happened. We're going to see a man from India unite Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs next time. His name is Mohandas Gandhi, and we'll see how he fought to free India of British rule. This is Mr. K's with 30.4A. 30.4A. I'm out.